Good morning, everyone. I say good morning because it's um, very early here in Washington. Uh, uh, <laughs> so um, I hope you are having a, a good afternoon over there, too. Um, we're here today to discuss a bit uh, digitalization and decentralization. Uh, we have the pleasure to count with um, Elena Ochenik. I hope my pronunciation is not so bad from Irina and uh, Enrique Meroño from Iberdrola. Unfortunately, uh, uh, DigiConnect cannot join us today, I think, because uh, they had an expected an emergency. Uh, but the idea today is to uh, try to discuss and use a bit the um, uh, recent report from IDENA, uh, talking about innovations in the energy sector, uh, to try to uh, organize uh, some thoughts on the way forward uh, in the, the work to do in the very in the near future in the energy sector. Um, I think I just uh, begin with a bit of housekeeping. Um, the organization of this event is very simple. Uh, first, uh, Idina is going to present a report and uh, Elena. Sorry. Idina is a bit. <laughs> uh, uh, Elena personally is going to present the report, and Enrique and me will going to to comment briefly on on it. Uh, and then we'll have uh, uh, a round of uh, comments, trying to uh, identify lessons from the report that can be used for the uh, near future work on on energy sector. Uh, not only regulation, but also um, uh, business model development, etc. Um, after that, we will try to wrap up uh, briefly, uh, about five minutes. Um, uh, probably it's going to be me, but also we will have some time for reaction from Elena and Enrique. And finally, 20 minutes for uh, Q&A. Um, I think the most important for thing for the audience is that we will have a, a, a forum, um, a discussion forum that you you see below the the slides where you can um, uh, write your comments at any point of this uh, debate, uh, and this is going to be used to. Uh, uh, present your questions and um, uh, the vehicle where we can uh, interact and um, communicate your questions and, and the, um, that will be answered at the end of, of this. Um, I will be keeping time. Sorry, Enrique, Elena. Uh, 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 don't be offended if I, if I <laughs> intervene a bit. Uh, and I think that's it. Uh, let's begin um, with this. The first intervention is going to be Elena, and it's going to present the very useful and interesting report uh, that I did not prepare. So the floor is yours, Elena. Thank you very much, Miguel. Okay, this is great. Uh, thank you also for keeping the time. I think this is useful uh, in, in, such a, in such a context in, uh, in an online debate. Um, I will start perhaps uh, by telling uh, who we are at IRENA, just in case someone uh, watching online uh, is not uh, aware of what we are doing. Um, IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, uh, is an international organization, uh, and we are advising member states in the energy transition. Um, now, uh, we, are, we have 160 uh, member states, so we have almost reached uh, universal membership. Uh, what you can see uh, in this uh, in this report that we have published at the end of February at an event uh, at the European uh, Commission in Brussels uh, is perhaps more than just a report. It is the outcome of almost three years of work, uh, and we see it as a toolbox. Now, um, the report uh, is in fact providing a landscape. We, we call this shortly the Innovation Landscape Report, and it helps policymakers um, to guide or to navigate so the very complex uh, landscape of innovations that are out there. Now, when we talk about innovations, it's key to understand that we are trying to integrate a higher share of variable renewable energy uh, into the system. Uh, 
Um, and this this calls uh, for an accelerated energy transition. I mean, the energy transition is already ongoing, uh, but to transform the power systems, uh, from our point of view, innovations are key. Uh, while we conducted all this work, um, we have we have seen three major uh, innovation trends. Uh, on uh, the supply side, we have seen a decentralization, uh, and this is also a part of the conversation that we will be having today. Uh, decentralization meaning we see more and more uh, renewable, uh, uh, especially solar and PV uh, power plants, uh, being not, no longer uh, centralized, but uh, being connected at the DSO level. Uh, another major trend that we have seen in terms of innovations um, is electrification of end use sectors, meaning uh, electrification with renewable power of other sectors such as mobility, industry, uh, heating and cooling in, in buildings. And the third, perhaps more interesting for our audience, uh, the third uh, innovation um, a trend that we observe is digitalization. Um, and digitalization is not happening only on one uh, side of the market or one end of uh, the supply chain, uh, but pretty much everywhere. Now, to make sense a bit of the wide variety of innovations that we've seen uh, around the globe, we have mapped this according to four different dimensions. Um, and perhaps I can move forward the slide for our, our audience to follow. Um, I don't need to go into detail, but uh, this is what I was just uh, quickly presenting, and we can come back to this if there are any questions uh, on the innovation trends. I will move the slides now uh, to the next uh, to the next one, which we've prepared. And the idea is not to have a, a presentation, uh, but rather a debate. Uh, and I will stop after this one. Um, so when we when we speak about innovations, at least from Irina's point of view, um, we are looking uh, at innovations across four dimensions. The first one uh, is enabling technologies. When we speak about enabling technologies, we don't uh, refer uh, to technologies to generate uh, power from renewables, but we refer here to technologies that help integrate renewables into the power system. Um, and perhaps here the most interesting uh, for our uh, discussion uh, today. Um, are the digital uh, technologies. Meaning, if you look at number six, seven, and eight, um, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and big data, as well as blockchain. Uh, the second uh, dimension, which is equally important from our point of view, uh, are innovations in business models. And this will emerge from the private sector, uh, not necessarily only from startups, but also from incumbents, um, from companies that have been established there and have been doing business for a while. But this is equally important from our point of view. The third dimension uh, refers to the market design and regular, regulatory changes uh, to the markets that are already in place. Um, I think it goes without, um, I think it's obvious and it goes without any further explanation, but maybe I will, I will just state this. Um, in countries where, where there's no established market, where we still have uh, vertically integrated companies, these innovations are not really relevant. So perhaps we have to go one step back. Uh, but still, uh, some of uh, the innovations listed here are emerging around the globe, not only in Europe, but we also see them um, in Australia and the United States. And the fourth, uh, the fourth dimension uh, that we look at uh, refers to system operation. Um, and when we discuss system operation here, we talk about innovative approaches to system operation, where we take into consideration, uh, for example, just to give one example, uh, cooperation between TSOs and DSOs, or the new roles of distribution system operators. Um, and uh, if I would like you to take perhaps one single message uh, as a takeaway message from, from today's uh, event, it is the following. Um, innovations enabling technologies um, are not enough. We need to apply a systemic approach when we go about this, especially if we want to accelerate uh, the global uh, energy transformation and the global energy transition. So applying a systemic view and combining um, innovations in all these four dimensions is crucial. And we can talk perhaps a little bit later how each of the countries or how each of the stakeholders can make use of this and how we can combine several, perhaps several enabling technologies, uh, combining blockchain, AI, uh, mini grids, super grids, you know, batteries. We, we, we can think of many things, we use this really as a toolbox, together with, uh, with the business model, uh, combining um, 
uh, aggregating uh, or bundling uh, several uh, consumer points uh, to have an innovative approach, how to market this further, and how to actually help uh, the system. And I would like to stop here, and uh, I'm waiting uh, for your reactions, and then we can uh, detail furthermore some of these aspects if there is any willingness to do it. Thank you very much, Elena, uh, uh, especially for having your five minutes exactly right. <laughs> Very interesting uh, presentation. I liked a lot the, the idea of systemic approach. Uh, it's very much aligned with uh, with our own view in the innovation area. Uh, uh, maybe Enrique can now comment a bit the uh, Iberdrola's views or his own views on. First of, all, uh, first of all, congratulations for the for the report because it's uh, I think it's very comprehensive and and. And the, I, I agree with, with Miguel also that the, the systemic uh, systemic view is something that we we consider a lot, uh, of course. Uh, what what I would like to 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 you know to highlight a little bit, uh, it's uh, in this situation uh, it's the importance of the of the networks in particular and the value of the grid in in, in a specific, because for for Iberdrola's view, uh, I think that the, one of the things that uh, that uh, digitalization uh, brings to us uh, is connectivity. Um, and if you see, for example, different sectors uh, uh, that uh, are uh, involved in the same in the same transition, like for example, uh, transportation. If you see transportation, uh, uh, we are uh, we are we, the starting point is at the centralized uh, uh, means of transportation. And uh, through digitalization, you are connecting one each other, and you are including the uh, the, the, the range of, of connectivity, basically. And in the case of uh, of of of, uh, of the Dallas view, networks are providing more or less uh, exactly the, the, the same connectivity with the with the advantage that you have already the network, and don't, you only need to include uh, the digital tools uh, inside the, the network. So basically, the connectivity brings tremendous benefits and um, and permits uh, that all these um, business models that you are uh, you are uh, summarizing in, in your slides uh, to put all that together and, and work together. So uh, you know that th there's uh, there's some views that that are talking about uh, that this is going to be a full decentralization in the future with uh, you know isolated. Uh, Areas of uh, of generation and and, and microgrids uh, isolated from the, from the rest of the network. But our point of view is that uh, this that uh, this these innovations, these kind of innovations that you you summarize, uh, and we agree 100 uh, percent, uh, are going. You are going to need the network for that. So so for us, the the main point of view would be that of co of course uh, there are certain kind of uh, particularities. Uh, you know the way that we digitalize uh, generation distribution and and the, and and the relationship with the customer is completely different, and the and the and the challenge are also also different. And maybe we can discuss that uh, uh, afterwards. But uh, our point of view, in particular, uh, would be first of all to take into account that uh, that this digitalization and this new business and these new uh, these new possibilities that the the digital area uh, brings to us. Uh, it's important to, to to have you know to take into account that the grid and the value of the grid uh, are going to provide this 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 advantage. So so for us it would be the the main the main uh, highlight idea that I would like to. Thank you very much, Enrique. Uh, uh, I mean, this is great because uh, probably you're going very much along the lines I wanted to introduce here. Um, uh, I think first, um, as Julia, I mean, it's my comments uh, to this very interesting report um, uh, would be um, the idea that um, IDENA is mapping uh, this large amount of um, innovations that will be relevant 
uh, in a very simple way, uh, gives a very nice view of the ecosystem of innovations or, or the landscape, as, as uh, Idina put it. Um, uh, what I miss, let's say, or, or the things that um, uh, would be discussing in, I would be discussing in, um, in this regard is that we don't have a, 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 I don't see a very clear tool to navigate through this landscape, no? to travel through the, through the landscape. In fact, Julia, Julia Branzi here is, is commenting um, precisely along these lines. No? How can we um, apply these categories to uh, a specific um, uh, situations? And one proposal uh, that is very, very common nowadays and, 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 and a very interesting view is what uh, Enrique was saying. Um, what we need to understand here is uh, that the network is going to provide the connectivity we need um, uh, to decentralize whatever we need to decentralize. Um, what I want to introduce is a, um, an additional dimension that I think is not so much uh, commented, um, uh, especially looking at, at these uh, innovations mapped by, by IDINA. Um, I can identify very well blockchain, and then I can identify very well new business models, uh, new market design, etc. cetera. Uh, what is not very clearly um, explain, let's say, is the way in which uh, we're going to do that. Uh, and I'm, I'm referring here specifically to the idea of a smart contract. Um, a smart contract is normally assumed to be a, a direct consequence of um, blockchain. Let's say a smart contract is just a coding of a series of rules uh, on blockchain. But I think the the the, an interesting discussion here is that even if we have the network uh, Enrique is commenting and recognizing, of course, uh, the value of this network uh, in the sense of infrastructure, uh, we need contracts to organize all this. And um, the way in which uh, we do those contracts is not obvious to me, in the sense that um, blockchain is a way to uh, re register peer-to-peer -peer transactions that is more efficient than we have now. So in principle, registering those contracts is easier. But um, my point is that registering contracts or transactions, let's say, is not the only thing contracts do. Um, let me uh, use a very simple example or a, a dimension, which is um, we don't have complete contracts right now. Uh, our contracts cannot specify every contingency that we're going to have in the future. So essentially, uh, a contract serves to uh, allocate rights to resolve conflict in cases where, uh, or in the cases that were not specified in the contract. Uh, contingencies that happen uh, that not specified in the contract. This is a very difficult question, um, very well treated in the literature, um, and the economic literature at least. But um, that's very difficult to code. So essentially, uh, what we're going to have is a, um, an allocation of, um, let's say, rights to decide in situations uh, that were unexpected. Um, I don't exactly see how you can do it decentrally or in a decentralized manner. Yeah, but essentially, my point is that that might be more expensive. I don't see that um, uh, decentralized contracts or decentralized trading, uh, even if possible, is necessarily more or cheaper than um, uh, centralized contracts. So still, we have a very difficult choice. Uh, um, we have a very difficult choice uh, here, which is whether we want decentralization or not. Uh, even with this digitalization, we still need to 
uh, compare institutions, compare contractual ways to do things, and uh, choose their uh, activities where we want to do that and activities where uh, we don't want to do it. For example, Alicia is commenting here uh, tokenization. Tokenization is not especially a new situation with the, um, in economic transactions. It's very similar to equitization. I mean, you're just uh, allocating small parts of uh, uh, the, um, um, let's say, the ownership of an asset among many parts, and you register that. So uh, the question is that uh, doing that is interesting because you share risk, but it's not very interesting in the cases where you have incentive problems, let's say uh, adverse selection, moral hazards, and so on. So um, what I would say here is that the way in which we can connect these, all these dimensions um, uh, should be the contractual part of this, and uh, probably it's not especially clear right now um, how can we do that. Yes, if I may react to this, I think there were many questions actually out there uh, before we actually get to the last point. Uh, so, so indeed, maybe maybe I will go one 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 question back. Um, so there was a question regarding um, I'm trying to find it in the chat right now. Um, I think it was from Julia, exactly. So whether there were, uh, she was saying that it was interesting to expand on how these categories of innovation uh, would be differently relevant uh, depending on the specific country uh, endowment with resources and the, degree of mar and the degree of market development. So before we go into detail about the difficulties and the challenges that blockchain uh, specifically bring, uh, what, is, what is important for us is, is we're not saying that um, one innovation trend is more important than the other, or that the networks should go towards decentralization and a um, series of microgrids, for example, especially when we talk about Europe. Um, so this framework should be seen um, in a wider perspective. So uh, when we map these innovations, we, we use 200 examples, real life examples of uh, projects that are trials that are being implemented around the globe. Um, so they're either still in development or are already being implemented. And some of them are city level, some of them are um, uh, startup companies um, implementing these, uh, others are wider, uh, larger corpora uh, uh, corporations. Now, maybe, maybe before we move forward, I can uh, give an example. And again, this is only one example of how we can use uh, these innovations um, together in order to provide smart solutions, if I may say, because we have smart technologies and we have smart, um, uh, we have innovations, but then the whole question is how do we apply this in a smart way? How do we find smart applications to them? Because in itself, blockchain, um, we're not there yet. We're going to come in a second to this. But in, in itself, each of these innovations alone, standalone, cannot help us tackle any problem. So perhaps we should ask, what is the problem uh, that we have? Um, what is the outcome or what, what is the current status that we'd like to change? Uh, what is the problem? And then try to solve it. So another way that we looked at, and the report really provides uh, dozens of pages of examples um, uh, around real life projects, but also provides of how we can, uh, for example, look at the system, at the power system today. Uh, and when we speak particularly about integrating renewables, how we can increase uh, the flexibility across the value chain, meaning from the demand side, to the supply side, but also the grid, uh, grid level, uh, for example, by providing long-term um, seasonal uh, storage solutions. Uh, and this is where we have, um, uh, this is where we have uh, enabling technologies uh, or and innovations in the category of enabling technologies, uh, such as uh, renewable power to hydrogen, renewable power to heat, uh, or others for shorter term uh, flexibility needs. Now, if I may use, I only prepared three slides, and I didn't use my first one, but perhaps I will be, uh, I will manage to use uh, the third one. Uh, here's an example uh, taken again from our from our work. Uh, we provided 11 such solutions, so we made a distinction here clearly between innovations, which are individual, between uh, among those four um, dimensions, and the combination of those innovations across the four dimensions, where we can come. Uh, 
to a conclusion and provide a, a, a smart solution. So here we have the example of a demand side flexibility solution. Um, and I could have taken a uh, demand response, but I decided today for our discussion uh, to use another one, uh, aggregating distributed energy resources for grid services. Um, I took this in purpose because I thought that here we have more uh, an illustration of more enabling technologies um, and to bring it for, I mean, to discuss about this today. So in enabling technologies, when we combine behind the meter batteries, with electric vehicle smart charging, together with uh, renewable power to heat in the residential sector, uh, together with the connecting devices, and we, we know that by in the next five, six years, we will have over 70 billion connected devices in our homes worldwide. It's, it's an important amount of data that we will unlock flexibility in the residential sector. So I'm, I'm just bringing this up there uh, as one other uh, digital innovation together with artificial intelligence and big data, where all this data that is, will be there uh, can fuel machine learning and give insights into behaviors, uh, into behaviors of consumers, uh, together with blockchain. And then we can discuss a little bit in more detail what this technology promises and what it doesn't today. Because I fully agree with you, Miguel. Uh, there are indeed open questions. And we can perhaps go into a bit more detail. But what I'm trying to highlight here that we uh, we're trying to see, see this a bit more wider. And then if we have aggregators, and I know now in Europe with the clean energy package, um, we have this opportunity. Aggregators can actually now start uh, to look around what they can do in more detail. They actually have a, re a, regulatory, a regulatory framework. Uh, well, this was not the case seven years ago, for example, when, we, when I first came personally across a company who was uh, saying, OK, we're an aggregator. And, we didn't really know what it was. Was it aggregator on the consumer side? Was it aggregation of um, on the supply side of the market when we're talking about solar PV? So really, seven years ago, when, when I first met such a company, I, I really didn't know what to do with it. Uh, I didn't know what to do with their business model. So today, I think in Europe, at least, if you want to, um, you know, not to keep just the Euro, Euro concentric uh, focus, um, this is already a big advancement. And it, it, uh, it's it's one step ahead compared to a few years ago, and perhaps even compared to other countries in other regions of the world. Um, now, again, without wanting to go into too many details, uh, when we aggregate also this, this distributed uh, energy resources, it's not enough to have the technology and to have smart people in the private sector proposing uh, these new uh, ways to monetize um, their ideas. But it, we also need to have the regulatory framework in place where we can actually um, integrate those resources into the market and so that it can actually help um, provide services to the grid uh, that the, the, the grid needs in terms of flexibility. And we've seen, I will just mention two examples um, in Europe, uh, the Donan Battery example here uh, in Europe, where they can actually provide um, uh, frequency re response. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, it's a, a sub-second uh, level. So if we aggregate all that demand, we can really unlock a lot of flexibility. So it's not just about um, um, decentralized and peer-to-peer -peer trading. We can even go a step further and look at the system today in Europe uh, and try to understand how we can provide services to the grid. Uh, and this is why I chose this, um, uh, this particular example. Uh, and then, I don't know if you want to react to this or whether we should speak also a little bit about blockchain. And I myself have some questions for you. Uh, because today what we see when we look at blockchain, um, we see that Europe is indeed emerging as one of the leaders uh, around uh, the globe. Uh, why am I saying this? Uh, we see uh, about 70 projects where blockchain is particularly um, uh, used or tested, uh, it's still tested actually, uh, for applications in the energy sector. This is a, a big amount, I think, of projects. We also see uh, around 400 million US dollars invested in, uh, in blockchain projects for energy. So this, again, it's not a small amount of money. So this means there are things happening. Um, uh, there's Perhaps we need to be a bit more patient. We're still talking about innovation. Uh, there are open questions that need to be addressed together with the regulators. Uh, but still, it's not insignificant. Uh, now, the question that I personally have, and perhaps this is up, up for discussion and also something to take forward for future collaboration, future open uh, conversations like this one, uh, is perhaps on the governance level. So 
indeed, how can we um, coordinate all actors uh, involved uh, in this sphere to actually come uh, and make and make some smart use of these uh, of, of, of blockchain and at least what they promise um, uh, to, to unlock. Uh, basically, we speak about ICT companies, we speak about regulators, about retailers, um, the DSO, the TSO. So perhaps we need to engage, and even the consumer. Perhaps we we're going a bit too fast, and we're not really talking about consumers and the role that um, uh, automatization has uh, in this in this uh, in this process. I'm trying to say is that personally, I don't really see myself uh, trying to optimize my energy consumption, my electricity consumption, with my electric vehicle and all my smart devices around the home, uh, around my home, which I will have in the next five years. As I was saying, if you want to reach of 75 uh, billion uh, connected devices, I don't see myself doing this um, on a daily basis. But I can actually see myself uh, setting some preferences um, where um, where someone uh, who, when I say someone, I mean, uh, I mean the aggregator in Europe, uh, will bundle uh, my preferences together with others in my neighborhood uh, and make perhaps use of the solar PV that is installed on, um, on, other, um, uh, on other houses or other homes, on, on the rooftop of other homes. Um, so then blockchain really has an added value. Uh, but again, how do we take this forward? I think a more open uh, dialogue is needed. And if I'm not mistaken, we have uh, we have lost Enrico, or is it Enrique, or is it just me? Uh, no, no, it's uh, everyone. It's um, you know the um, companies are always like this, no? It's uh, the dark figure. <laughs> it's the <back. laughs> But I I, li I like your idea, Elena. That uh, nobody is talking about uh, because I agree with you a lot that nobody is talking about the smart. It, everyone says smart contracts, smart methods, but we need also smart consumers no? <laughs> uh, to do that. Uh, also, there's a point that that, uh, that is expensive because to react you need signals, and with this Internet of Things, uh, investing in a cheap something to uh, for your freezer, speak to your toaster, might not be especially interesting, but uh, let's see what Enrique, who, who I hope is. I'm not sure if he's still online. Let's see. Yeah, yeah. Hello, can you listen to me? Yes, yes. 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 You know, we can hear you. My webcam, because uh, you know it looks like I'm frozen uh, or blank, but uh, I can hear you and see you in my my monitor. Perfect. <laughs> I'm not. Yes, I'm not a. <laughs> I'm not a good, a good example. Yes, um, I, I, I think that uh, some of the points that uh, Elena raised are probably what uh, you know everybody is facing right now uh, in the sector. I can give you the utility uh, point of view of what we are what we are going to do. In the next, uh, in the next uh, months or, or you know, the next couple of years, basically, because uh, the main problem here is that we have all the pieces of the puzzle, but uh, but we don't know really uh, the not only the right way to connect the pieces, but uh, at what price sometimes or with what rules. So uh, uh, the the issue here is that uh, what we are trying, what we are trying to do. It's, uh, we have the advantage that we are we have a, a very intensive presence in five markets: uh, Spain, of course, uh, UK, US, uh, Mexico, and Brazil. So in each in each market, you have a different regulation with different with different rules, and and in each market, uh, you have also different assets. Not only because in some markets we have more renewables than others. Uh, but also because uh, in some markets we have different types of policy, different heritage of investment in certain things, uh, in certain kind of assets. So, so we are we we, we are we have different types of policy. So what we are doing is one uh, location, one one city, one place. 
in order to launch that kind of smart city concept, trying to involve all these kind of different business models, different uh, transactions, uh, and in parallel, of course, we are we are uh, doing different kind of uh, development in each country. In each country, for example, think about about blockchain. Well, recently, uh, we we use blockchain to guarantee the energy that we are supplying to customers. That that energy that we are supplying is 100 percent renewable. Uh, it's the first experiment that uh, that we did. Uh, we 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 did that with uh, with the financial entity Cucha Bank, which is a bank. Uh, in the north of Spain, in the Basque Country, and uh, and that, that 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 we try just to 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 to, te to test that and to check uh, the different possibilities of blockchain in uh, this kind of peer-to-peer uh, -peer transaction, and and also we we are starting to to working on that also in, in the the energy management area as well. So, but but it is that we are trying to use one kind of uh, testbed uh, city. In order to 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 try to to test all these different uh, possibilities with the with the hardware and software and with the different possible signal prices, uh, regulatory regulatory uh, you know uh, laboratory as well to, to different measures, in order uh, to suggest uh, to regulatory authorities what would be the, the the next step. So so you know it's a very pragmatic approach. Uh, I don't have the Solution for some of the questions that you raised before, but uh, but this is what we are doing right now in a, in a current uh, in this current scenario. Very much, um, Enrique. Uh, in fact, that was exactly what I asked uh, from you. It's uh, Jaxi Jaxi Mons, uh, not the year, so. Um, uh, uh, very quickly, uh, I think before uh, uh, we go uh, for for Q and A, um, um, I would say uh, my point uh, with contracting, uh, I think it's very clear in in what you were saying. No, even in with this, if we see this. Um, um, this is live from the the eleven solutions from from Elena. Uh, which is a very nice uh, map of of things that that we need. Uh, probably the the <clears throat> next step or the the next question I have is um, how do we do with talking about blockchain or the future of of uh, systems in general? Is um, uh, where is financing? In the sense that. Um, um, where different ways of financing uh, enters the, the picture, because for me that's uh, uh, very not clear. In the sense that uh, blockchain is very nice, but it's not very clear uh, whether they're going to provide new ways of trading or just new ways of um, interchanging information. And I think that the uh, if we think in terms of contract, that might be a problem uh, with me because I work with regulation, so I always think uh, of um, uh, the contracts uh, among players. Uh, I would say the, the idea of contracts allows uh, going from the technologies you mentioned uh, to probably business models uh, in the sense that Technologies might allow different ways of contracting, which allows different ways of financing, which allows different business models. And that's a that's a question. It's been raised here in the chat, um, uh, which is what are the barriers? Because if you have the technology to decentralize, very often it's said then we should decentralize. If we don't decentralize, if we don't scale up peer-to-peer -peer transactions. It's because there are regulatory barriers, and uh, I understand the reasoning, and uh, it's a valid point. But there are there is also a, a different uh, or a, a, an alternative explanation that is peer-to-peer -peer transactions are more expensive, 
that's something that already happened in 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 stock exchanges, for example. I mean, it's everyone was saying uh, over the counter transactions would be the future, blah blah blah. But in the end, uh, trading with a third party, the same exchanges, centralized exchanges, is uh, necessary or at least cheaper for uh, many of the of the trades you need. So what I would say probably is that uh, in the future, uh, what we will see is the coexistence of um, uh, peer-to-peer transactions and centralized trading. And uh, for me, the next step in, in that process is identifying uh, precisely that question, which are the, the transactions that can be organized by peer-to-peer trade and they're not organized like that because of regulatory barriers. And things that are better organized through centralized trading, and we should not be concerned by that. Uh, as an initial thought for, for that, what I would say is that um, um, economic theory gives a hint of, of the kind of um, result we can expect. Um, in the sense that the centralized trading uh, in other situations in the past uh, has been proved uh, very difficult in situations where conflict is very important. A uh, typical example of that is uh, long-term contract for infrastructure, power line, a uh, uh, big power plant. Uh, you need a long-term contract to get the financing and build um, things and so on. The, Power Purchase Agreement, for example, that Enrique was commenting in, in Latin America. Uh, these are very difficult contracts, uh, and it's inefficient to allocate ownership to many parties in that, or, or control rights to many parties in, in that situation. So probably uh, in things that need a, a big investment, uh, we will not see um, many decentralized uh, trading. On the other hand, when conflict is not very important, or, uh, for example, investment in energy communities, etc., we need where incentives are more or less aligned, probably peer-to-peer -peer trading is um, interesting and probably if it's not scaling up, can be technology, but probably it's also uh, some kind of market design barrier. So uh, my idea for the next steps uh, in the very short term is that uh, we should identify uh, in more detail, be more specific about uh, the way in which you, you go through technologies to business models uh, and then market design in order to, to identify those barriers. Uh, because doing that, the networks Enrique was commenting and the system, the way in which the systems uh, should operate, flexibility and so on, uh, can be better defined in the sense that they should serve, they should provide, should facilitate the kind of trading uh, we want. Um, I think um, there's a, there's a um, for this, I think for, for the wrap up, this could be enough. And uh, um, um, I would like to um, introduce some very interesting questions here. If you have another, uh, Elena and Enrique, uh, please feel free. Yes, perhaps I wanted to, before we go to Q&A, I wanted to react quickly, um, um, uh, perhaps, to, to what you just uh, indicated. Um, okay. So the question of do we want peer-to-peer -peer trading and how to make use of the enabling technologies and how we integrate, let's say, the business models. Again, I think I think perhaps we should ask ourselves what is the problem? Are we unhappy with the system right now? Or do we really want to go towards more decentralization, or or is the issue really um, we need more um, we need to integrate into the markets uh, what we see all those distributed energy resources being uh, the demand response uh, that can be unlocked from all those smart homes. Uh, be it uh, an aggregation or a bundling of all, all those um, 
uh, of the electricity produced uh, from uh, rooftop uh, solar PV uh, plants. Or I, I think the question is, what is really the problem that we're trying trying to solve before we go uh, into a little bit deeper? And now with blockchain, and there was um, now I'm just touching a little bit on one of the questions that was asked before, um, but this I think is very important to mention. Um, yes, cybersecurity risks are real. Uh, GDPR and privacy issues, and how how much are consumers willing to actually engage with the market? This is a question where I, for now, for the time being, I haven't seen a lot of data uh, coming uh, from behavioral economics. So uh, I've seen some data, but again, sometimes the conclusions are contradicting, so we don't really know. Uh, if we know exactly how much we spend, if we know how much CO2, for example, um, uh, contains uh, our, uh, or our, so let, let me rephrase it, if you know uh, our, uh, our CO2 consumption uh, by using the electricity in our homes and all the devices, and if we have detailed granular data on this, because now with Internet of Things, we will be able to have this. And for a matter of fact, we know that there are startups out there providing this sort of, uh, working on this sort of solution. Uh, but again, they're not marketed yet, they don't have a business case yet, because uh, the regulatory framework uh, is not very interesting for them. Um, but even, let's say, if we fix all these things, uh, once the consumer is very well informed, uh, let's say we, we, uh, we go forward two years from now uh, and we solve all those problems uh, uh, for blockchain, as you were saying, um, but we also fix the problem of interoperability. Let's say there's no issues there. Uh, again, we come back to the consumer. Are they willing to engage? Do we, are we sure that um, uh, we will respect GDPR and the privacy regulations? So I, I think I think there are more questions, uh, as you see, as we move forward into more detail, especially when we talk about blockchain, I think there are more questions which are open and are up for discussion. I don't have personally an answer to this, but I think it's important to start this dialogue, to actually start raising awareness. Uh, but there's another point, uh, and I've seen recently, actually last week, to be very precise, I've seen a demonstration uh, of how blockchain works. Uh, and in fact, um, some of the developers, they were saying, um, we are not reinventing the market. We are just uh, mapping, uh, you know, we are using uh, the market structure that is, that is there today in Europe. So we have, uh, they had intraday markets, we, uh, we map uh, balancing markets, uh, and then we're just adding this as a tool, so as a way to trade automatically based on certain preferences and based on um, uh, based on the units, the generation units on the storage units, basically on the distributed energy resources that every home has. Um, so they're claiming uh, that they are not really, um, let's say, reinventing our uh, business models or not, sorry, our market designs. Um, but again, perhaps inviting them uh, when we go forward in this conversation, seeing what the challenges are and how we can bring uh, this whole agenda forward. Great, Elena, because it, it, that's that's uh, very related with uh, what Enrique was saying. Uh, or the, what um, um, Iberdrola is is doing um, uh, elsewhere. I I I would um, like to 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 ask uh, Enrique and also Elena uh, um, uh, the question from Bernhard, um, um, which is very related. Um, I mean, with, uh, with to what you were saying, I think, which is, um, do we have value in in uh, in these transactions? I mean, lot shifting, etc. This kind of reaction of uh, response um, uh, it's enough with uh, providing price signals in the sense that we're talking about here with blockchain and so on, you will be sending price signals or you will need something more, I mean, in terms of behavioral measures yes. or or something like that. It's a, it's a, it's a very good What question. do you think, Enrique? <laughs> no, no, no. I don't right. mean to say that. <laughs> because it depends. Uh, but uh, it's a, in this situation, uh, what, what we are facing is that uh, there are different layers that are working in parallel. And sometimes it's very difficult to, to have a clear idea because it depends of, of a lot of different layers. What I tend to say is that, for example, in the case of, uh, of behavioral uh, 
it, it's similar, for example, that we happen with the smartphones application. Uh, uh, in a in a period of in a certain moment of of, of uh, you know the first three five years, the impression of the market was that the you are going to be rich and and you're going to earn a lot of money, uh, you know, with the new app in your in your cell phone, and 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 after that, you know. Uh, you know, it was a, a decrease of the of the enthusiasm, and 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 you realize that the people are. Oh, um, Enrique, I I can't hear you. I I think maybe um, because I I understand what you're saying is um uh, or, or my feeling at least in in uh, in all this is that uh, we don't know very well. And, uh, and uh, we need to we need to test uh, uh, whether it's interesting or not. It's um, uh, and and I think it's important because we we say two things uh, at the same times very often. One is uh, we have regulatory barriers and and that's a problem with uh, with um, scaling up these projects. And on the other hand, we say we don't know exactly what to do. Uh, probably we need to organize a bit this. Uh, but uh, Michelle has here um, a question, um, um, which is, in my view, um, a very important application of this, and, and probably where things are moving forward more clearly, which is related to uh, middle-income countries or low-income countries, whatever, uh, uh, such Latin America. Uh, uh, whether uh, the idea would be um, um, whether we can use these new technologies, the digitalization, to um, uh, make the system cheaper, in the sense that uh, there are many people that cannot afford the uh, electricity services. Um, one of the main points, or one of the first point, is making energy services cheaper. Uh, do you think this is going to be possible with Idina and you think? What do you think? Um, so the question is, um, I think the, the question is, for, uh, I'm not sure if it's the right question to ask. I mean, can digitalization really lead to more affordable electricity uh, in middle-income countries, for example? Um, I'm not sure the answer is positive, um, because digitalization will come at the cost. Uh, the question is, do we want to start uh, to put a burden on households where uh, perhaps uh, 50 euros a year um, is not insignificant? I, I'm not sure. So I think this needs to be really taken into account in a, in a wider scope. And of course, in this transition, we want to not only just to have an energy transition, but also a just transition. So we need to take into account also this, uh, uh, this, this aspect. Um, but again, we need to look at every country at what, what the real problem is. Because if there's, uh, let's say, if the problem is having access to electricity in the first place, I'm not sure we answer this with digitalization. Uh, if the problem is we need more flexible systems and we can allow flexibility on the demand side uh, of the market, because we know that there are many uh, consumers, many households, a lot of uh, new loads. Uh, we will see in the future more and more electric vehicles. If we can use this smartly for the system to provide services, then I think digitalization is indeed uh, an answer. Uh, and then again, do we want to unlock this? Yes, OK, but what next? Uh, again, I would like to insist on the automation, automatization, um, because we can hardly see one consumer uh, optimizing, spending time on the electricity market, trying to understand uh, and receiving signals and reacting based on that. So. Digitalization, in this point of view, will play a, cru a crucial role. Uh, now, if I may go perhaps to some of the questions, uh, I know we don't have much time left. <laughs> I feel a bit. Uh, I think it's a bit pity because I also uh, could not follow fully uh, what. You have, you have three minutes, three minutes have. Elena. Okay. Um, and, uh, we need to shut up. Perhaps after the question that. Natasha has asked: Which type of regulation or regulatory formula? would be the most suitable for DSOs to challenge uh, increased investments. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question totally, but to challenge increased investment demand related to new technologies and digitalization. Um, here, again, de depends what role the DSOs will play in the future, and depends what the country uh, or the continent we're, we're speaking of. But 
if we assume um, that the DSOs will play a role um, as a regulated entity, as a, as a, new, as a, as a, as a market f facilitator, providing a level playing field for all market participants so that these investments um, will come from the private sector, then the question should be revised. It's not really uh, what, do, I mean, what do the DSOs need to do? I would say, well, they would need to play a role uh, in enabling or facilitating, uh, providing this neutral uh, marketplace uh, so that uh, um, ideas and innovations from the private sector and innovative business model would uh, arise. And I will only give one example um, that we see emerging a lot, uh, especially in Europe, in the UK, in Germany, uh, especially, uh, with flexibility marketplaces. Um, so if the DSOs are willing uh, to play this role uh, and engage in conversations with the innovators, when I say innovators here, I, I, I don't necessarily mean uh, people who are innovating in terms of technology, but also having innovative business models. If we let them trial, uh, if, if, we, if we keep an open and cooperative approach uh, and let them test a little bit, see whether consumers are reacting, whether there is enough flexibility, uh, whether the DSOs can use this flexibility in their operations, whether perhaps DSOs can uh, collaborate uh, with TSOs to provide this local flexibility need uh, uh, to the TSO uh, needs. Perhaps then we can come up with some, some smart solutions. Uh, but again, I, I think we need to have this wider, uh, take this wider approach, but also look concretely what is already there, what is the problem, what is the issue we have, what are the solutions that we can apply by combining uh, several of these innovations that are there. And of course, uh, if I may wrap up uh, and finalize with this, when we speak about blockchain, I think we, we, we are just starting uh, to have this conversation and uh, more uh, dialogues need to happen uh, on this topic. Perfect. Okay, I I I going to close with that. Uh, uh, I think probably the next step for me, uh, even before the more conversations or we need of Elena, is to define a bit better what are the conversations about, um, because. Um, uh, the the idea that all innovative business model is, needs to be successful, and if it's not successful, is because there's a regulatory barrier. It's uh, 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 limited, and um, um, I of course agree in the in in what Elena was saying about. Um, um, putting together everyone, that's uh, for sure very needed. Uh, but we need to be more specific, I think, in the kind of discussions uh, uh, we need to have. Um, so I think with this uh, kind of agreeing everyone, uh, we're going to close this. Uh, it's uh, been a very nice conversation. I hope we come up uh, very soon, we will come up very soon with some kind of conclusions, wrap up, uh, about this and uh, I'll see you soon in other events. <laughs>